Καλησπέρα. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, it's, a, it's a moment of uh, many uh, premiere. First, I must confess that this is my first Davos. Then, it's an honor to open the first day of the first Greek house in Davos ever. And it's also a pleasure to be able to do, open these uh, uh, proceedings. First of all, uh, applauding wholeheartedly the organizers for promoting informed debate about Greece, and also for having the courage to place the Greek current affairs in economy, society, and politics in the broader context of the European Union. I'm very humbled and very grateful to be given this opportunity to talk you briefly on uh, Europe in the new geopolitical context, a theme which is very close to my heart, but it's also very close to my portfolio responsibilities in the Commission. The European Union has, for many years, it's not a secret, been criticized for being slow, technocratic, cumbersome, and incomprehensible. I still remember President Obama's words in Warsaw when he last met uh, European leaders in July 2016, when he said, I'm a great fan of Europe, especially after Hillary explained it to me. <laughs> so uh, I think that this Europe that has suffered for Outside. It's outside. It's outside. Okay. It's outside. <laughs> I feel reassured. So th this Europe that has suffered for many years from this reputation deficit, I also think that we have a collectively many reasons to be proud of uh, its reaction in this sequence of unprecedented crisis that shaped the European Union in the last 30 nightmarish months. We had uh, a pandemic the first since 1918. Immediately after that, we have a new type of hybrid threat, which was the instrumentalization of migration flaws from authoritarian leaders who wanted to attack the European Union by weaponizing people's suffering. And now we have a war in our doorstep. And in these unprecedented historic challenges, I think Europe and Greece played a central role, providing global, daring, and bold responses. When it comes to the pandemic, we designed, implemented, and paid for the most ambitious vaccination program in the history of humanity. Five billion vaccine doses for all Europeans, regardless of their place of origin, or, or residence, or socioeconomic condition. We had a chance to prove that at this very difficult moment, the Union stands solidarity with all its citizens. Next to that, we implemented the COVID certificate and we issued 1.4 billion such certificates that allowed us to take our lives back. And at the same time, we set a world standard with these certificates as more than 60 third countries across the world simply imitated the European model. And finally, for the first time, we crossed the Rubicon, the moment when Europe finally became a fiscal union by activating the recovery uh, fund that allowed us to use the EU budget to leverage money in the markets and finance symmetrically the recovery of our member states, assuming as a union the burden of this effort. I still remember during the painful Eurozone economic crisis, many friends from the US and Asia criticizing Europe for lacking a common fiscal backstop and being unable to react together in difficult moments. Well, we made it. We proved them wrong. Equally, we succeeded in repelling the instrumentalization of migration flows first in the Greek Turkish border in Evros, a few months later in the Spanish enclave in Northern Africa of Ceuta, and 
in September last year in the Belarus uh, uh, border with Lithuania, Poland and Latvia. We managed to protect our market, our society, and we managed to defend a Europe that knows how to react when authoritarian leaders think that they can blackmail or harass us. Our message to the world when it comes to this phenomena was clear. We will welcome legal migration. We will remain an asylum destination for everyone fleeing war and persecution, but we will not tolerate being threatened or the use of innocent people as political pawns in geopolitical games. And the final and probably the most daunting challenge is of course the illegal, unprovoked Russian invasion of Ukraine and the tragic return to militant nationalism and revisionism on European soil. Europe's coordination, unity, was also unprecedented. We proved that Europe's condemnation is anything but symbolic, and we marked a new phase for the Union in the geopolitical sphere with very important daring actions on different fronts. First, we provided assistance its breadth and its size to Ukraine and Ukrainians having no parallel. Since the aggression started, we mobilized more than 4 billion euros to support Ukraine's overall economic, social and financial resilience. And for the first time ever, yet another Rubicon or Hamiltonian moment, if you like, with EU taxpayers' money, we have provided military assistance. We purchased weapons for the uh, struggle of the Ukrainian people in the order of 1.5 billion euros, with 500 million more being underway. Secondly, also for the first time in EU history, we activated the Temporary Protection Directive, providing immediate and unconditional access to our job markets, health, education, and residence schemes to the 5 million Ukrainian refugees that fled their homes as a result of the war. This was a big moment for Europe, a moment that showed once again that we can take difficult decisions in difficult times. And now we are implementing also a set of deep, intensive sanctions. Already five packages of sanctions have been agreed and enacted, and we are now actually uh, putting the latest touches on the sixth package proposed in May that includes the unprecedented yet difficult move on an oil embargo. In the field of energy, we are not, I must confess, on a very pleasant situation. But our goal is to make sure that sanctions will maximize impact on the Russian aggressor whilst at the same time minimize the cost to us. Our priority is to drastically reduce all collateral damage for our European Union partners and member states. And we cannot be able to help Ukraine if we do not protect our own economy in these difficult moments. It is for this reason that we are accelerating our efforts to become independent of Russian gas and oil with the recently announced Repower EU plan, which will be discussed by EU heads of state and government in the end of the month, and with an overall financial envelope of 200 billion euros in energy instruments to be deployed by 2027. Dear friends, Agapiti Fili, let me conclude this uh, short presentation by trying to take you into a broader macroscopic view of the things yet to come. We are witnessing a period of major tectonic geopolitical change. This is not a favorable landscape and we are witnessing many elements of a perfect storm around us. But this pessimistic outlook can at the same time 
be the birth certificate of a more alert, astute, less naive geopolitical Europe that is slowly but surely increasingly taking on responsibility for security, economy and resilience. No one can say that Europe has been on the sidelines in the last two and a half years. Our response in these unprecedented challenges was bold, was robust and most importantly was unitary. And I assure you that it will continue to be like this. We are now working full time to make sure that we have major resilience in our defense and foreign policy. There will be no united Europe unless we manage to build a Europe of defense and a Europe of common action in the external front. Our analysis of defense investments that we published only last week recommends many practical, tangible and feasible ways to increase efficiencies, stop with unnecessary spending and stimulate common defense capabilities, common equipment and technology innovation. We will also invest aggressively in energy infrastructure, both within Europe and with like-minded third countries and partners to make sure that we have a joint procurement mechanism so that member states are not competing with each other for energy. And this is the vaccine's way. We have learned how the vaccine's method works. We are ready to do the same on energy. Uh, the country I know best, and that brings us all here, Greece, will be a key player in all these developments. As highlighted by Prime Minister Mitsotakis in his historic address to the joint session of the US Congress last week, Greece has been unequivocally supportive of strong European stance together with our Western partners in all these major developments. Greece is acting with Team Europe as a shield in hybrid attacks, as a lever for delivering aid and weapons to Ukraine and welcoming Ukrainian refugees. And Greece is now a major co key contributor in European public affairs and in common policies. As we invest in our capabilities to become a major geopolitical actor, Greece has critical advantages, critical assets to bring to the table. And I hope that the Greek House in Davos will be a perfect forum to discuss this. We can be a major energy hub for Southeastern Europe. We can be a rolling platform for LNG. We can be a key strategic actor through the Alexandropolis port and Suda Bay. All these are assets that our country has and can deploy in favor of the European Union and our NATO and Western allies. So with this, I hope, positive thoughts in mind and many opportunities also ahead of us, ahead of you, I would like to thank you all very much for your attention. I wish you a rewarding and productive World Economic Forum. Thank you.